Hey guys, this is Mr. O'Brien here. And in this video, we're going to be talking about biotic interactions in an ecosystem. So this is going to be part four of your topic eight ecology chapter. And again, the thing we have to remember here is biotic means living. So what we're going to be talking about is the living factors or the interaction between living things in an ecosystem. So let's get started here. And the first type of interaction is probably the one that everybody is most familiar with, the predator-prey interaction. And how quickly populations grow and the maximum size they can attain are often the result of interactions with other populations of organisms. So a predator-prey interaction is where one organism consumes the other. So what we have here is a lynx, and a lynx is a type of cat, kind of like a bobcat. And what their primary food source is, is the hair, kind of like a rabbit. So the lynx and the hare have this interaction where the lynx eats the hair. The lynx is the predator and the prey is the hare. So obviously it makes sense the population of the lynx is going to affect the population of the rabbit or hare population. So this is kind of what that uh, predator-prey interaction looks like. So if we notice here, when the population of the prey gets really high, what we see is a corresponding um, curve a little bit later on when the predator becomes high. So what you'll notice here is the prey will become high first and as a response, because there's a lot of prey, the predator's population will increase. And once that happens and the, the predators are very high, they start consuming more and more prey. And what will happen is the prey will then begin to fall off. When the predators fall off, the prey increases. So what we see is this kind of curve that kind of goes along with one another. When the uh, prey is high, the predators will let later become high. When the predators become high, they'll eat more prey and then the population will drop. So over time, we see this cyclical approach to the predator-prey interactions. Now, another type of uh, interaction animals have is what's known as competition. So competition is where organisms and populations compete for resources. So again, um, this could be water, could be food, could be territory, or it could be competing of mates. So we have two different types of competition. When the competition occurs within, the, within members of the same species, so that's the key there, same species, we call that intraspecific competition. So that would be the example down here of these two ibex. So these two ibex right here, the two males, are fighting. And why they're fighting is they're fighting for the right to mate with the females. So we have competi competition amongst individuals in the same species for... Um, it could be even water, food, territory as well, but the major one that you will see is the competition to mate. Now, interspecific competition occurs between different species. So that would be like this right here. Now, you'll notice the lion killed some sort of animal right there, but what is actually happening is the hyenas are actually competing with the lion to take that prey. So we have this competition called intraspecific competition between different species, and they're competing for the same food, the same water, and also the same territory to hunt as well. So again, competition, they are trying to win the right to have those resources. And the more resources you have, the better chance you have of survival. Now, some organisms have developed uh, some pretty cool adaptions to avoid directly competing with their own species. So for example, the dandelion up here, um, they will actually send their seeds far away to avoid sharing the same soil. So instead of those seeds just dropping straight down, dandelion seeds will get caught in the wind and blow sometimes miles away from the original location. So again, that is a way for them to, comp uh, to eliminate competition with the mother plant. The next one is wolves. And wolves, just like dogs, mark and occupy a territory so they have enough hunting space. So what wolves will do is they will mark their hunting territory on the outside by peeing on trees. So when another group of wolves will come in, you have one of two options. They smell it and they say, oh, this is somebody else's territory. Let's move on. Or they'll challenge that pack of wolves for the right to hunt in that area. 
And the final one is the adult monarch butterfly. Now the adult monarch butterfly, excuse me, the adult monarch butterflies and their caterpillars each utilize the same plant, but they utilize different parts of the plant. So the caterpillars will actually, they will actually utilize the leaves. And what they will do is they will eat the leaves and they will form what's known as a chrysalis. So what happens then is when those uh, individuals turn into adults, the butterfly will actually utilize the flower part of it. Well, let's draw that in purple just to make it a little more obvious. So again, they utilize different portions of the plant, therefore they're not competing with one another. Now, we also have a term called symbiosis, and all symbiosis is just referred to as close relationships. And these involve a lot of close contact between two different species. Now, we have three different types of symbiosis. The first one we have is referred to as mutualism. And mutualism is when the relationship benefits both organisms. So when we're looking at mutualism, organism one benefits, organism two benefits. Both of them are happy in this interaction. They're both benefiting from one another. The next one we have is commensalism. Now, commensalism, commensalism is when one organism benefits while the other one is unaffected. So one organism could care less that that interaction is happening. The other one is benefiting from it. The final one we have is parasitism. Parasitism is when one organism benefits at the expense of the other one. So there is a parasite and then there is a host. The host is the one that is being negatively affected. In other words, the parasite is extracting resources from it. And the parasite is beneficial in this interaction. They get a positive interaction from it. So those are the three types of symbioses that we have. So again, commensalism, species A receives benefit, species B is unaffected. In other words, to think about this is smiley face for species A, and then for species B, it's like, eh, whatever. Mutualism, again, both receive the benefits. So both of them at the end of this interaction are smiley faces, are happy. Parasitism, one of them benefits the parasite, and one of them is negatively harmed even harmed to the point where they could die eventually. So again, these are the three types of symbioses of how animals interact. Now let's look at some examples here and let's see if you can kind of figure these out while I read over it. So this one is an example of a blue whale or any sort of whale, I should say, and barnacles. So barnacles are these attached pieces right here. So barnacles create a home by attaching themselves to the whale. The whale is unaffected. So in other words, one of them is benefiting the barnacle. They get a place to live. They're kind of safe. And the other one is unaffected. So this would be an example of commensalism. Again, one benefiting the barnacle and one of them is unaffected. The whale really doesn't care. So the next one we have is our clownfish. And our clownfish have a mucus coating that allows them to live in the sea anemone. Now, these sea anemones that you see here are actually poisonous to most organisms, so it's kind of like a protection. But since these clownfish have that mucus, they are unaffected. So their presence attracts other fish for the sea anemones to eat. So in this case, the clownfish is benefiting. The anemone is benefiting. This is mutualism. So in other words, clownfish right here, he's happy. The sea anemone, he's happy. Both of them are benefiting mutualism, mutualistic interaction. Now we have a bison, this big guy right here. And then we also have cowbirds. So bison walk through grass and as they walk through the grass, insects are disturbed and fly away. They are eaten by the cowbird. So in this case, the bison, he really doesn't care. 
he's going to walk through that field anyway. But these cowbirds are getting an easy access to a meal. So this is an example of commensalism. One benefiting, one unaffected by the interaction. Then finally, or I guess uh, I still have one more here, but uh, the next one we have is ostriches and, and gazelles. So the ostriches and gazelles, they feed next to each other. So, and the reason that they feed next to each other is that ostriches have excellent eyesight. They can see, they're up high, they can see for a long way. While gazelles have a strong sense of hearing and smell. So between the two, they have covered all the senses. So in this case, the ostrich benefits because the gazelle covers the hearing and smell, and the gazelle benefits because he doesn't see as well. So both of them are benefiting, therefore we have another mutualism interaction here. And then finally the last one we have is mistletoe, the thing that you kiss under under Christmas time. Well, Mistletoe kind of has a dark side, and mistletoe actually extracts water and nutrients directly from spruce trees. So in this case, the mistletoe, it's getting its nutrients, it's happy, while as the spruce tree is losing nutrients and is not happy. So this is a great example of parasitism. One benefiting, one being negatively affected. So hopefully this video helps you out with biotic or living interactions in an ecosystem. Again, this is another part of your topic eight ecology chapter. Hopefully it helps you out.